humans are odd. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Today is day 71 since five-year-old Summer Wells disappeared. I'm sorry that I missed day 70. There was an extended power outage here. I just want to thank those of you who reached out, those of you who were concerned, but it was just a really long time that the power was down. Humans are odd, but why are they odd? Well, in this episode, we're going to deal with Don's psychology and we're going to refer to an excellent book, The Scout Mindset, to get a stronger handle on what is actually going on with Don's thought process. Now, those in the true crime community tend to be more familiar with criminal psychology. One finds a particular perpetrator conforms to a particular pattern. In this episode, we're not going to deal with criminal psychology per se, just psychology. And in this case, Don's rather peculiar approach to the disappearance of his daughter. But before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment. If comments are disabled, head on to Twitter using the hashtag SummerWells. And let's get started. Once again, in the true crime community, many of us tend to be, I think, fairly good at identifying red flags. We tend to be quite accurate at seeing that something seems to be awry, something seems to be wrong. And um, that's with regard to things like demeanor. But it's also important to be specific about saying why something doesn't ring true. Okay, it, it, it doesn't ring true, but why? What is actually going on? Can, can we define it? Can we be specific? And so in this episode, we're going to try to psychoanalyze Don. Worth plan for? Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm going to assume that most of my audience know about Don and have a fairly good memory of the events over the past uh, 71 days. You remember the things that he said. You remember the things that he's done. But just to uh, recap, Don made a number of statements to the media in the early days after Summer Wells went missing. Then he followed that up with the Sermon on the Mount with his wife sitting by his side. And then there was an appearance and a prayer here and there from Don in a church setting. And then there's been a ping pong game, especially recently, of he said, he said, you're an idiot between Don and another channel. Right now, Don feels, I think, hard done by. He feels betrayed. He feels someone else is to blame. But what's really going on with Don's thinking process at a much more basic level? Last night during the lengthy power outage that I mentioned, I did some additional reading from the Scout Mindset. I wasn't trying to do work or research, I was simply reading. And then on page 33 in chapter 3, in a chapter titled, Why the Truth is More Valuable Than We Realize, author Julia Galef dedicated a section to overvaluing the soldier mindset. More specifically, Galef introduced the concept of present bias as a form of self-sabotage. Now, if you want the definition, the present bias refers to the tendency of people to give stronger weight to payoffs that are closer to the present time when considering trade-offs between two future moments. And that's from... That's a quote from O'Donoghue and Rabin. Present bias sounds to me like a modern definition of the old concept known as delayed gratification. And so just in a very simple way, when, when you have constant instant gratification, that actually leads to long-term pain. Whereas delayed gratification over the long term means long-term pleasure, long-term happiness longer-term success. I have spoken in previous videos about poor impulse control and how that is part of the smorgasbord of symptoms associated with FAS. It does feel as if poor impulse control is an appropriate catch-all to cover at least some of the malaise bedeviling the folks at Chalet Wells, doesn't it? I think a lot of people who see poverty 
feel sympathy and compassion, and that's certainly something that edifies them. It's good to uh, feel sorry for people, to have um, sensitive feelings to people who are struggling or suffering. That's good. But I think it's also important to see things as deterministic. In other words, things don't happen randomly. Things happen because of what we habitually do. Things happen because of habitual thinking patterns, habitual decisions, a lifetime of either constructive decisions and actions or a lifetime of destructive actions. Now let's deal with the scout mindset's position on this point. Present bias is a kind of intuitive decision making that we all apply in some way. Some of us care more about short term consequences and too little about long term consequences. Do you think that applies to Don? Do you think Don is more preoccupied with short term consequences than long term consequences? Let me give you an example. Telling a lie has the short term consequence that one is off the hook theoretically short term. Prior to someone following up and finding out, one can escape responsibility or even um, censure in the, in the sense that someone may think badly of you if you told the truth. But what if someone does follow up? Well, those are the long-term consequences. Galef refers to everyday examples of this impatience that is associated with present bias. And she explains, and this is a quote from her book, it's around about chapter 3, I think page 33. She writes, quote, As we get more impatient, the potential rewards grow closer. When you contemplate a gym membership, the trade-off seems worth it. Just a few hours exercising per week in exchange for a new and better you. Sign me up. But on any given morning, when faced with a reality check of having to get up and actually go to gym and actually do the work, well, there's another trade-off. What if you slept in? If you did, you would immediately feel better. You would immediately have a sense of relief going back to sleep and you know, remaining in the comfort of your bed. So if we go to page 34, Galef writes, The rewards of choosing to sleep in are immediate. The rewards of choosing to exercise are diffuse, meaning unclear, as well as delayed. What difference will one exercise session make to your long-term fitness goals anyway? It's widely known that present bias shapes our choices about how to act. That's in general. What's much less appreciated is that it also shapes our choices about how to think. Just like sleeping in, breaking your diet, or procrastinating on your work, we reap the rewards of thinking in soldier mindset right away, while the costs don't come due until later. So in other words, there are costs related to thinking in a particular way, to habitual thinking in a particular way. If you're worried about a mistake you made and you convince yourself that it wasn't my fault, you're rewarded with a bit of instant emotional relief. But the cost is that you miss out on learning from your mistakes. Present bias means we get worse at either acknowledging our mistakes or learning from our mistakes. I think that's quite important to emphasize is that present bias can actually get worse over time. So if it's not something that you're able to manage, it's something you're not managing, well, you're going to become more and more impatient, more and more addicted uh, to that sort of outcome, that instant outcome. So we may become increasingly patient and then feel starved for that instant feel-good feeling. Now, think about present bias in the context of an addict. You take a hit and feel good now, or you don't, and you feel terrible, you feel unsatisfied, and you're confronted with that unpleasant reality, and you've got to sit with that reality. The trouble is, once the hit wears off, this is if you take the hit, reality comes knocking, and you're just that little bit poorer, that little bit number and less able to adapt to your worsening conditions than you were before the hit. And then multiply that hit by 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000. And who are you going to be at the end of all of that? Also, no matter how you spin it, an addict is often the person responsible for them being an addict. So it's only an addict who can make the executive decision not to be one. And arguably, that decision is one of the hardest they'll ever make. 
assuming they make it, because to do so means finally learning, or if they fail after making that decision, failing to learn, to delay instant gratification. Galef also takes it further, comparing present bias to the glowing endorsement we give ourselves, and let's face it, we all do this, when we meet someone we're attracted to for the first time. According to Galef, quote, overestimating your positive traits is most effective in the early days of a relationship, whether, whether that is romantic, professional, or otherwise, end quote. The same is true of an investigation. Casting shade and providing a glowing endorsement for yourself as a parent, as a father, as a Christian may work in the beginning. You know, saying that something could be a, an abduction or providing some sort of scenario in the, right in the beginning may seem as though it is um, likely, more likely than it really is. Let's go back to Galev. Quote, when someone meets you, they have very little information about your qualities as a person. So they forced to rely on proxies such as how confident does he seem in his own quality? End quote. Now, if you think about it, Don has been super confident, hasn't he? He knew immediately, for example, there was an abductor. He scoffed at the cops for imagining Summer um, may have wandered into the woods. So in case you're a little bit rusty about Don being sort of over-optimistic, do you remember what he said when he was asked about Summer being healthy? He said that she was 100%. He said Summer was very healthy, very, very healthy in every way, mentally, physically healthy in every way, no problems at all. Doesn't that sound over-optimistic, especially given what we know about, for example, her teeth? At one point, he also said that his older son would never hurt her or nothing. I mean, in the history of siblings, I don't think it's that unusual that a sibling hurts another sibling. When Don says, I kind of favored Summer a lot, and he and the boys understood, um, they never held that against me. I think he's being a little overly optimistic, don't you? There are quite a few other examples, but another one that comes to mind is Don saying, you know, he got there really early and, and the police hadn't arrived. I think he was kind of overly optimistic that that, um, that, that was the case. That I know it's a strange thing to say that, that that is optimism, but, you know, I think it will possibly come out later that the police were there pretty early on. I just, I think in general, Don has been super confident. He, he knew immediately... There was an abductor. He scoffed at the cops who were imagining Summer might have wandered into the woods. But going back to the author, Galev, she says, quote, But the longer a person spends with you, the more information they get about your actual strengths and weaknesses, and the less they need to rely on your confidence as a proxy, end quote. And so we have been getting to know Don's strengths and weaknesses over time, in particular his weaknesses, a lot of those have emerged in the last couple of days. And so we take that and you compare that to Don's confident um, uh, portrayal of himself, either on YouTube or on Facebook or to certain people. You tend to sort of bear in mind that you, you almost want to push that aside, given other information that is coming to light, um, not from Don, you know, from other sources. I must say, I love how Galef concludes with this particular segment. Again, this is a quote from a book, quote, Being overly optimistic about your chance of success gives you a burst of motivation right away. But those motivational benefits dwindle over time or even backfire when success takes longer than you predicted. And as Francis Bacon said, Hope is a good breakfast, but a bad supper. End quote. Is Don overly optimistic about things, do you think? Don's been participating on this channel and the next. Do you think that's about Don having a present bias where right at that moment, you know, when he's talking, when it's, you know, happening, he feels relief that he's addressed any problems, any concerns, any doubts folks might have about him. He feels like he's dealt with it. But then as time goes by, more questions arise. The church and the Welsh couple seem to think we should, we should have hope. 
Hope that summer will be found. Hope in Don and Candace's innocence. Will it turn out to be a good breakfast early into the investigation, but a bad supper at the end of it? Now, I'm not going to take it further than that. I do just want to emphasize some of the benefits of delayed gratification. You might say de um, delaying gratification is good, but why is it good? Well, one, it strengthens impulse control to improve your ability to save money. I mean, one of the, one of the obvious things with saving money is not spending money as you get it. You delay spending. So it's one of the ways you can um, not be poor. Um, another one is it teaches the benefit of hard work. It, it teaches that there's a, a reason to to put in an effort, right? It, there's a reason to have self-discipline. It helps us to become more appreciative. So, you know, when we get the thing that we've been working for, we appreciate it so much more. In other words, it helps us to um, see value in in certain things that are perhaps valuable. Also, it increases your healthy decisions. Uh, it helps get rid of the guilt that comes with taking the easy way out. I think guilt is part of that. And overall, it helps you to enjoy life more because your value structure is correct. It's aligned properly. Just something else to consider is Don and Candace's impulsivity and if that applies on social media. Do you think it does? I think it's quite important to think about because we are all consumers of social media. And so this may apply to you as well. Do you think Don has low impulse control on Facebook? I can tell you, since I started writing books nearly 10 years ago, I've had to shorten my chapters and my books. Why? Because attention spans have shortened. The need for payoffs, as an article that I'll put a link to in the description indicates, the need for payoffs is also higher. So this need for getting a kind of a a sense of gratification is also higher these days. Now, Facebook actually uses instant gratification to monopolize our attentions, just as drugs monopolize the lives of addicts. If we're not good in our application of present bias, if we can't help ourselves or stop ourselves, we get all the supply in the moment we want, but end up achieving nothing over the longer term. You can spend a whole day getting all the sort of um, what you sort of feel like you need, but you end up actually doing nothing. So we end up as miserable procrastinators and we're impoverished because of it. And it's important to recognize if that's happening, when that's happening. Think about it. Anything worthwhile requires work and the price of our paying attention to something. The more we work and the greater the price we can pay for a longer period of time, the more worthwhile the thing we get at the end. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.